Hmm? Critter Hunter. All right, so I'm here with Simon Pierce. Thank you for letting me talk to you. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be able to catch up with you kind of in person in the 2020 way. Yeah, I got to interview you uh, maybe two years ago now on my website, but not like, you know, verbally. <laughs> now, it would be so, nice to be able to update. Yeah, I remember that interview. It was just I had a, a million questions, so I had to delete half of them. <laughs> <laughs> so... Good thing for the coronavirus, I guess. I could at least talk to some cool people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's nice. This is like socializing these days. Yeah, this is, yeah. So no no Galapagos lately, huh? No, not since, uh, when was it, September last year. So um, we, we've still got some sharks that are pinging around with the tags that we deployed last year. But, um, yeah, I, I can't see myself getting back there this year. There's um, Fortunately, some of the team is based in Ecuador, and they think they might be able to get out, I think, in, um, I think next month, actually, is the plan. Um, but, yeah, I don't think many of us will be able to join them. Yeah, I don't think Ecuador is doing very good, last I, last I heard. Yeah. 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 Philippines is... is it's starting to open up, but not the diving. So it's really annoying. Yeah. I think even the flights at the moment, like from, say, the flights I would normally take to South America, either to um, Argentina through Air New Zealand, and that's been stopped, and or LATAM over to Chile. And like that, I, I see LATAM has just declared bankruptcy. So, um, oh. there's, yeah, no, no, no very good options right at the moment. Oh, that's not good. So there's probably, is there any whale sharks in uh, New Zealand? Uh, in summer, uh, there are a few. I think not enough to, like, have a research program on them. <laughs> um, but uh, there's, they do see, they usually they get a handful of sightings each each year. Yeah, there's um, whale sharks kind of like water above about 21 degrees. So northern New Zealand's well within their temperature range. But um, often they're probably going to be further offshore than people are going to be looking. Oh, yeah. So I'm trying to think of the routes where I've seen them. And I've seen them from Kenya. I saw a whole bunch in Kenya. Oh, yeah. And right. then uh, Mexico. And then uh, I haven't been to Ecuador. So Costa Rica, same area. And then I guess across the Pacific, now Philippines. And then mm. down to uh, Western Australia. Yeah, so I it was, guess, yeah, I guess Western there's... Australia is the closest place to me at the moment. <laughs> yeah, or Philippines, it's debatable. I think it's probably closer here almost. Yeah. For you. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah it's probably not far off, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's what I was going to ask you about. So the huge ones are in Galapagos, right, that you've been... Uh, Tracking? Yeah, so that's been the place where we've been able to consistently sort of access the biggest ones. Uh, what we're thinking now based on the, uh, like we've been tagging them and tracking them in various parts of the world, and it seems like the, the juvenile sharks uh, that are more typically seen at sort of places where there's tourism tend to, often they'll come to the coast and they'll, oft, they'll also go into the open ocean. Uh, but these really big ones uh, just hardly ever come to the coast come to the coast like they're, they're not often over the continental shelf in less than about 200 meters deep depth of water uh, so to be able to go and find them really have to go and meet them on their terms which tends to be these sort of oceanic islands like like northern galapagos and things yeah and so how come i think we've talked about this before but we're gonna go over everything um but how it's probably come all changed the... anyway <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Yeah, because that was one of the things you were saying is uh, whale sharks are, there's a lot you don't know, huge mystery about those ones. Yeah, right? it's, yeah. so I mean, it's still the case, unfortunately, for us. There's um, So we've got a pretty good idea about what the juvenile males are doing, because those are the ones, for some reason, uh, that tend to be in the places you'd 
you'd call kind of like tourism areas, like basically the places that you have seen them, um, it's it's most likely to be juvenile males at those areas. And it's the same for almost everywhere I work. Um, so we don't know very much about what the adults of either sex are doing, really. And these um, juveniles of less than about three meters uh, are really enigmatic. It's kind of like, I don't know, like on sea turtles, they used to talk about the lost years of like what the babies were doing until they were up to about plate size. And it's kind of like, that's what it's like for us with whale sharks up to about three meters as well. And then even the juvenile females, like, I mean, you do see some of them in places like uh, the Philippines and stuff, but it's, it's a much lower proportion than the males. So somewhere out there, we'd expect to be uh, like it's probably about like one to one sort of sex ratio, um, but we're just missing the juvenile females at this stage. So, so the the small ones they have in Oslab are probably female. Mostly males, probably. Yeah, are mostly male? juvenile males. Yeah. And then the big ones and lady are maybe female. Um, so, I think. Pretty much everywhere in the Philippines, it's mostly males. Um, oh, really? Yeah, and then the place where you're most likely to see adults, it seems, is Donsol. They do get a few um, adult males there, uh, like kind of smaller adult males. And, and, of course, there's been a few babies picked up there as well. So they, Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, yeah, yeah, which is super interesting. I don't think they're really seeing many adult females like around the sort of tourism area but obviously there's some interesting stuff going on in that vicinity yeah because the last time i was going to mention that the last time we talked you said nobody has hardly ever saw the really small babies and yeah. then i was like man uh and then after that i started seeing them like on uh social media and whatnot and i, I saw that they caught one in don Sol, probably like two or three feet long yeah some really <laughs> yeah there's the one that got me actually i saw uh, a post on facebook and someone had a video of one off dumagiri um which really? was a very small whale shell like only about a meter long and i was just freaking out because you know like it's mostly a macro diving site so if i and i'd love to go diving there so it's like that's, I would that's have my where i'm at right on. now yeah it's just so i was every, pretty much every dive since then if there was any opportunity that something might turn up i've had a gopro on my camera just yeah. in case so if something like that happened i could still capture it because i mean seeing a baby whale shark when i had a macro lens on would kill me <laughs> yeah uh, yeah i i live here in, in dumaguete and for the last year for some weird reason we've also had a whale go by we don't know why wow. I, I don't I don't know I don't remember if it's a, a humpback or a baby blue whale I can't remember <laughs> but we could see it from the dive resorts just swimming by like real close to shore uh, oh, like a couple times a year <laughs> yeah so we're like whoa you can see it when you go or or they did see it when they get take the boats to Apple Island yeah they're like I have no idea where that came from <laughs> it's like hopefully it keeps coming back or else it's just very off course. Yeah, it, it did for a while. So, but, but anyways, yeah, there's they started seeing some tiny ones. I seen some in uh, Maldives too, really mm. tiny whale shark. Yeah, yep. like yeah, there's been a few babies there too. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. So, how do you guys? So last time, like that blank spot. I think you were trying to figure out where they uh, give birth. Basically, is that what you were trying to figure out? Well, we've actually moved back a step probably since then. Um, so there's, at the time, we were thinking that a lot of these adult females we were seeing in various places were probably pregnant. And since then, we've been able to use um, underwater ultrasounds to test out that hypothesis. And it doesn't look like they are now. Um, would probably be the best, like the the best guess is that they're not pregnant at uh the ones we've examined anyway at places like the galapagos what? yeah so um Aww. so we've gone from trying to figure out where these like thought to be pregnant females were going and where they might be dropping their pups to trying to figure out just actually which females are pregnant and and where they might be heading so yeah that's the thing with the pups is that they've they've popped up in pretty kind of random areas and um and often places where large females are actually not frequently seen, like 
like around Don Sol and like the Maldives and that, like they don't often see adult sharks around the Maldives. So it's just like, mm, these little babies just kind of cruising around on their own or, or is there, is there more to it? It's... So man, if that, I saw your videos, I can't believe if that wasn't a pregnant shark, it was just huge yeah. anyway. Yeah. I, I mean, they're, they're enormous sharks, but it's looking like, so there's this kind of uh, bulge behind the, um, uh, the pelvic fins, like around the sort of waist of the shark. And we were thinking that was an indicator of pregnancy, but it's increasingly looking like just as they start maturing and the reproductive organs uh, start increasing in size and that, that, um, that that's, it's, it's maybe something to do with that, like whether it's an energy store or something, because there isn't actually organs in that portion. It's just kind of muscle and connected. Yeah, it's sort of muscle and thick skin connective tissue. So there's something weird going on there because like pretty much uh, all sharks and rays are, well, they don't show um, what we call sexual dimorphism, um, which is really common in land animals and that you've got like, say with deer or something like the males have got like big antlers and stuff and the females don't. And that, so it's easy to tell apart the males from the females. Whereas with sharks and rays, they pretty much, pretty much look the same apart from the presence or absence of claspers, which are the male reproductive organ. So it looks like in whale sharks, they actually have got a feature um, that could distinguish the sexes when they become adults, but we, we just, we're not used to that in sharks. So we weren't really thinking that. So it's kind of, um, it's been a, a useful lesson in the importance of not making assumptions as a scientist. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. So is there, I, I saw a recent video you were you were having problems with the trackers with the other sharks uh, using it. It looked like bait or something. Yeah, so, yeah, particularly in the Galapagos, because, I mean, up where we work at Darwin Island, it's, like, literally the, the highest biomass of fish in the world up there, and most of it's sharks. So it's an incredibly yeah. sharky area, like, with you've got – um, schools of scalloped hammerheads and um, Galapagos sharks, silky sharks, black tips, all sorts of things going on. And and also things like um, some really large trevally as well. Um, but yeah, so we were putting these tags on the sharks to try and, um, on the, the whale sharks to try and figure out where they were going. And the idea was that we would have the tag on about a one and a half meter tether. So when the shark was swimming close to the surface, the tag would be able to float up and transmit satellite. Um, but yeah, it was looking a bit like a fishing lure, it seems to, to some of these predatory sharks. So sometimes literally on the same dive, uh, we'd tag a whale shark at the start of dive and then the sh same shark would swim past us again. And the tag was already gone. And I was just like, oh, it kills us. Cause I mean, it's, uh -huh. it's so expensive to get up there and the tags themselves are really expensive. Um, so we've been kind of playing around with different options and sort of keep on kind of evolving the attachment mechanisms and stuff so the last year we trialed um these like just just quite small clamps that just um clamp onto the top of the dorsal fin so when the shark is up at the surface and the dorsal fin sticking out then you can get a transmission and it seems like that's probably the probably the best thing we've found so far so i'm i'm keen to keep working on that and um see if we can get like keep getting some good results from from those attachment mechanisms and and have you been able to track them very far um, yeah, there, so there's one of them that's still at least one of them that's still pinging around but the the issue is well the issue can be that sometimes they're not coming to the surface that often for like weeks on end um but yeah there's at least one that's cruising around the eastern pacific at the moment so we're getting a few i can't remember what kind of the record is now but i mean they I mean, whale sharks are like routinely swimming a sort of tens of thousands of kilometers a year. It's just they often they're not in a straight line. They might just be going around in circles. <laughs> but um, but yeah, those those adult females, they really do seem to move around. But so far, they've stuck to that kind of eastern Pacific area from about Peru up to, um, I think... Uh, around Malpalo Island in Colombia is about the furthest north we've had them so far. So they haven't really connected with the the big sharks that they see sometimes off the Pacific coast of Mexico and places like Socorro as yet. But it, it might be a, a mixed population, but we haven't seen evidence of it so far. 
Well, that's crazy to think about that they go that far, but they're not the same ones. Uh, yeah. Much yeah, yeah. Well, of course, also, though, we're limited with the, um, I, I mean, so our, our ability to keep the tags on the sharks has been a limitation, um, but also just the battery life of the tags. Like, at the absolute max, you might be getting sort of a year or two out of them if you're really lucky and they do stay on the shark for that long. Um, so given that we think now whale sharks probably live to about 100, 130 years old. Of course, we're only getting quite a small snapshot of their lives, really. Um, so they, and especially if these ones aren't necessarily pregnant, they might just be going as far as like the nearest good feeding area, potentially, um, and, and not really bothering to go much further than that. So, uh, yeah, still lots of questions there. It'd be nice to be able to like, I mean, maybe as the technology evolves, we might be able to get more kind of solar powered tags or something that might have longer battery lives. Uh, but yeah, it's still kind of in active development, all this technology at the moment. So basically, there's none that are confirmed to cross the Pacific, like from Peru to Philippines or something. So there's been a um, one track from Mexico and one track from Panama. Uh, that did show that they were crossing over most of the of the Pacific. But the the issue with the tags that were being used is that it's very difficult to distinguish a tag that's detached from the shark and floating on the surface uh, from a tag that is still actively attached to the shark and like showing diving behavior and things. So at the moment, um, there's yeah, there's been these couple of tags. I'm leaning towards thinking that they were floating and not actually attached to a shark at the time. Um, it, but certainly, like, we've also got photo identification data, like a few hundred sharks identified from the Galapagos now. And of course, like, La Marvin and team have, have um, identified, I think, over a thousand whale sharks now from the Philippines. And we haven't seen any, like, direct evidence of sharks we've seen in Galapagos, for instance, crossing over to the Philippines. I didn't know there were that many. I didn't know there were that many in the Philippines. Do they know how many there are in the world? Um, there's the problem has been that like about last time I checked, about seventy five percent of the sharks that had been like photo identified were these juvenile males. Um, so we know that we're not capturing all of the population at the moment. There's um. We've got about 11,000 individual sharks identified on the global database, which is at uh, whaleshark.org. So that's the global photo identification library. Um, of course, that's only like uh, very much a minimum number. And and there's definitely a lot more sharks out there. Uh, so there's, at the moment, the kind of genetic estimates are um, pretty rough, but we, we're guessing there might, like, I, I don't really know is the short answer, but like gun to my head, I'd be saying sort of like high tens of thousands to like low hundreds of thousands probably, which is like, it kind of sounds like a lot, but then also if you consider like a single decent sized city <laughs> with the human population, it's like, oh, that's not very many considering they're distributed all, all across the world. Yeah, it doesn't really sound like a lot, especially 10,000. 10, yeah. Well. So, do, do, uh, this is a stupid question, but you, you know, they have the markings that you can identify each one, right? Um, yeah. Do they change when they grow? No, Are that's a great question, um, actually. And, and that's one of the things that the, like that photo identification like really requires because we know some sharks are, are likely to change their spots over time, like things like, um, like zebra sharks, for instance. Um, that mm -hmm. do clearly change from when they're juveniles to adults. Um, yeah. With whale sharks, no one's been able to, like, say, take a photo of a really young one and yeah, then track yeah. it through to adulthood, uh, just because, well, partly we haven't had long enough time. Um, but there have been the same sharks turning up to Western Australia for over 20 years now, and they are still identifiable um, based on their spots. So certainly once they get to a few meters long, we think the the spots are pretty stable and we can kind of prove that with the information we have now. Uh, but whether they are stable from birth, it's it's we we don't have that information. Certainly the babies do have spots. Um, but also the the very biggest ones, I mean I guess there's a possibility they may kind of fade a bit and be tougher to identify. 
but we're talking kind of like a hundred year lifespan there. So it might not really matter in the um, average researcher's career anyway. <laughs> it's probably enough to be getting yeah. on with. Yeah. Well, so there's, there's not much more uh, that we know now than a couple of years ago. <laughs> no, I promise. I promise we're working. Like, no, is there a lot of you? Uh, not too many. No, there's so, I mean, the Philippines is a bit of a hub. Um, and so we actually, it was really nice last year. We had um, a whale shark conference, like just for just about that species in Western Australia. And, and Ningaloo Reef, of course, is kind of the home of whale shark research and tourism and stuff. So that was awesome. And we had a lot of representatives from the tourism industry there and also from like government, the management authorities. And we probably had about, um, I think maybe kind of 80, 100 people and probably about, I'm guessing, I'm guessing maybe 30 or 40 of them were researchers. Um, so for a shark, that's an incredible number of researchers. I mean, most species won't have anyone that's kind of dedicated to them. Um, but yeah, it's like whale sharks. They are a pretty enigmatic species. Just when they're across, like, well, when they're out in the open ocean, that's pretty hard to get a handle on what they're doing with the current technology. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of work going in to try and understand their movements and ecology. Yeah, it's fascinating. And didn't you? Didn't you? Uh, were you studying mantas at all? Yeah, I've done a bit. Um, there's so. I work at the Marine Megafauna Foundation and I co-founded that um, sort of quite a few years ago now uh, with my friend Andrea Marshall, who's a manta researcher, and she was the first person to do her PhD on manta rays. So um, she's done a lot of global manta work and I've worked with her and her postgraduate students and collaborators in a few different places as well. Um, I, was, I was helping out with a bit of stuff in Indonesia over the last couple of years, which has been a lot of fun. Yeah, I've, I've seen some mantas in Indonesia. That's an awesome place. Oh, I love it. Yeah, warm water. <laughs> My, oh, yeah, Bali and Komodo, definitely mm. warm. Uh, my my wife, here in Dumaguete, they have a marine biology uh, university. My my wife is thinking about going back to school and studying oh, nice something. Yeah, uh, yeah. Probably not whale sharks. I don't know what. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, plenty of options. Yeah, there's a lot. That's that's actually a good thing about the city. I mean, besides the macro, that's why I'm here. But uh, there's so many people to talk to. There's a lot of marine biologists here. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I've got to get down there at some point. It's like it seems like such a cool place. Uh, I love it here. I uh, I'm trying to. Yeah, I'm doing a whole bunch of series of all the. Well, when I can get back in the water, of all the different little species and stuff, it's just an mm. awesome place for that. Yeah, yeah, I want to go and geek <laughs> but, out about the frogfish. Oh, I just interviewed uh, Dan Gary about oh, frogfish. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And I took I took his course last year about frogfish. Yeah, he's a he's a fanatic. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand why. They're pretty cute. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that that's another fascinating s subject about why certain species are only on certain islands and how they how they spread and everything they don't know much about those either yeah there's a there's one in indonesia that's super rare the psychedelic frogfish oh i've seen pictures of those yeah yeah amazing yeah it's just fascinating because they give birth a different way and it doesn't spread like plankton so they're only mm. on that one island so yeah it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. But the whale sharks are pretty infamous here in the Philippines. You probably you probably know about those. Yeah. You're a lady, right? When you study? Um, I've so I've done a I've been to Oslo a few times. Um I've been to Leyte um but uh, unsuccessfully. Uh, we didn't see any sharks over there, but like got to at least check the place out. And I've done several trips out to Tupataha. Um Oh yeah, I forgot about Tupia. Yeah. Mm, yeah so and, and i've done a bit of diving in other places like malapascua and things but yeah most of the research in the last few years is focused on tubataha yeah i totally forgot about that that's an awesome place oh, i love it yeah it's one of my favorite places to go and it's just such a good example of like really really good marine conservation in action i think are, are you able to talk about uh oslob ah uh, sure yep 
I, I've I've been in this debate a thousand times, and a lot of biologists just don't want to don't want to talk about it. No, no. I mean, I mean, you know, it's it's. Um, I'm happy to talk about it, but like with the caveat that it's it's my opinion. You know, like there's. Yeah. Well, I mean, people, who people else will disagree? Who else would have a? <laughs> Yeah, but I think you should probably be an expert opinion there. <laughs> yeah, well, like, yeah, we've got a bit of we've got a bit of experience with whale shark tourism around the world for sure. Um, yeah. I've I, I have been to Oslo a, a, a couple of times, so I've got I do have an opinion on it. <laughs> First off, when was the last time you were there? Uh, it's it's actually been a few years. So uh, the last time was I think 2016, 2017. So. Were you studying or were you just touristing or what was that? What... Um, combination of both, really. So I've been working with uh, the large marine, um, what is it? Large Marine Vertebrates Research Institute of the Philippines, LAMABE, um, for several years on different projects. And they have had an active research project at Oslo since just a few months after the tourism started there. Um, so I've been there to... Um, I've stayed in Oslo um, a couple of times and, and went out to sort of check out what was going on in that, partly so I could form my own opinion on it and also yep. just to, um, so I was, I was working with the research team, but I wasn't really there researching myself. Like I was just kind of informing myself of the research that was going on and, and having a bit of a look around because um, it is obviously it's a, it's a very interesting uh, whale shark tourism area for for all sorts of reasons. Um, so it's good to have some experience there. But we've we are actually working on a whale shark textbook at the moment, and um, the the chapter on whale shark tourism has been led by um, uh, Jackie Ziegler, who has done quite a few papers on Oslo. Uh, so I feel like I'm reasonably familiar with what's going on now, based on the research that's been going on. Well, I guess so. They're okay with it. This foundation. Um. So the. Uh, I I don't want to speak for them, but the. Um, All right. Well, how about how about? Oh well, no, no. I just I can just um. But like, I don't want to speak for them. Uh. But their their um main interest has been to work with the the management authority and the tourism industry itself, um, to continue to help them we call it kind of adaptive management. So based on the new information that I've got, so they can continue uh, improving the practices uh, that go on and making sure it does adhere to as close as possible as to what best practice tourism um, is considered to be. So yeah, I know, I know a lot of the improvements that have been put in place there have been like thanks to their work really, although they don't necessarily make a lot of noise about it. Yeah, I've been. They've they flown me down there twice, and I didn't even know they were. Those guys were part of it. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I, there's will, a lot of rules and stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, part of it is just that uh, they don't really do media um, because they want to. Like, if they've got, if they've got suggestions to make, then they make it directly to the management authorities and the tourism industry. So there's like, they're not they're not trying to um, change things like via media. Um, so yeah, they, they keep it kind of internal so they can continue working with them to to keep getting it as close to best practice as, as it can be. So, well, I went down there probably four years ago and it was, it was pretty mellow. There was, I think five boats and, you know, only they can go one at a time. And there's some rules and stuff. And then I went down there last year, and it was just pandemonium. They were trying to do the same rules, but with 10 times the people. Yeah. Um, so it was just, uh, I mean, it was impossible to get shots of the sharks with no people. Um, yeah. I don't know how to describe it. It wasn't, uh, well, I just, it, it, <laughs> I would just, does it, does it, is it harmful to the sharks? Because I hear the, the arguments where, it's better than being hunted, but then I hear biologists and historians here saying they're not hunted anyway, so it's just yeah. exploitation. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to it. Like, so, um, 
I mean, economically, undeniably, I mean, it's been amazing for that community. Um, it's the best thing the in Cebu. Oh, it's man. The, it's the highest uh, tourist attraction in Cebu. I think they're making like 30 grand a day now. Yeah, right. Um, for the sharks, uh, I don't, like, in, in terms of is that better than being killed? I, I mean, yes, of course. But, like, I, I think that's, that's, um, kind of a, a false dichotomy, really. Um, so, I mean, as, as you point out, like, uh, as people have said, there was no active hunting from that community. I mean, whale sharks have been protected in the Philippines since 1998. Um, yeah. So it wasn't like, oh, these fishermen were hunting sharks and now there's tourism. It's like, well, no, those were, they, they did used to be hunting of whale sharks in the Philippines, but most of it was like around uh, Bohol and, and Mindanao, I think. Um, so for I don't think that argument holds a lot of weight um, for me. Um, the other thing, I, my main thing with whale shark tourism is that whale sharks are a globally endangered species. Um, as far as we know, their populations are still declining. So for tourism industries, I think the, given that people are making money out of an endangered species, the, the, for it to be anywhere close to ecotourism, to my mind, the species itself has to be benefiting from that tourism. And at the moment, I think Oslob is a missed opportunity. Um, so there's certainly the last time I was there and from what I've heard more recently as well um, in terms of the education like it's not very good and i think the opportunity to create kind of hundreds of thousands of ambassadors for whale shark conservation each year is being missed uh, through a lack of education um, and also like the money that is being generated is is i'm not aware that any of it is really going into whale shark conservation like even the the research that's there to help them kind of um like manage it that is not being funded by the tourism and and to an extent they choose to stay separate so they are an independent voice um but also it's not really going into any other whale shark related conservation measures that i can see so i would not call it a conservation project um i'd also say that for people that are interested in a really nice tourism like a wildlife tourism experience then um it's not a very good one like it is it's it's very crowded and most people when i've been there most people were more interested in getting selfies with the whale sharks than actually like having a look at the whale sharks themselves has definitely been my impression of the place yeah that's that's basically exactly what i was thinking last times i was there the first time it was a little better i felt like uh a little bit of uh awareness or whatever is better than nothing especially mm. in philippines where there's no education really and everybody thinks sharks are crazy you know dangerous and you should kill them and whatever um so i thought the little tiny bit of awareness is better than none but then mm -hmm. on the second time i went it was just so completely crowded it's just a novelty selfie kind of you know the new age instagram selfie kind of a thing nobody really yeah. gave it nobody cares about you yeah. know i yeah. went there during a filipino holiday so there's no tourists just filipinos because they had not working that day so there's thousands of people there and yeah there was zero education there's a five minute briefing about what not to do but that was it so yeah and i don't uh, know how much that's really adhered to out in the water anyway yeah uh well it's impossible it i mean i'm the one i'm the number one advocate about not touching marine life and it was literally almost impossible not to touch one because you're like being pushed and um yeah. you know so and i was i was one trying not to <laughs> so yeah there's people diving down and getting in the way in in front of it while it's moving and holding on to it and all kinds of stuff yeah, and that's right. just on the one day I was there. Yeah. And and it was just in the news that Bohol Bohol is thinking about setting some so starting to feed the sharks too. Uh, okay. Setting something up some similar situation. Well when when people see the amount of money coming into Oslo from that, I mean you can't blame them from for thinking about setting up something similar. But um 
yeah, like I don't necessarily think it's, I don't think it's anywhere near what it could be at Oslob at this point. So I would be very hesitant about um, something else starting up. The thing is, there is really good wild whale shark tourism in, in the Philippines as well. I mean, the, uh, they've discovered quite a few whale sharks off um, of uh, Puerto Princesa now, and that's a really good spot for them. Like, I mean, Tubataha has always been amazing, but of course, Tubataha is pretty hard to get to for most people. Um, but like, there's day trips going out from Puerto Princesa now, and there's it looks like a really good experience. They're working with researchers and things down there as well. Um, Leyte is, I think, a really good example of uh, like actual ecotourism, like in that there's a lot of community involvement and things. Um, Don Sol, of course, has been operating for a while. Uh, I haven't been up there myself. I have heard there's some issues with uh, overcrowding up there. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I, I always, people people do often ask me about Oslo, and I tend to encourage them to go and explore um, other opportunities in the Philippines for whale sharks, really. Oh, yeah. I have a thousand videos about Philippines, and I've never, I've never showed Oslo. So, and I've lived here, I've dove all over the country. It's just not, uh, even if it's, even if it was all the money went to uh, your research, um, it's still not like the greatest, uh, it's not, it's not that fun for a critter hunter, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I mean, I tend to uh, like, yeah, I, I mean, I'm the same. I, I choose not to because um, I, I'm quite a keen underwater photographer um, and I do post stuff online sporadically, but I kind of choose not to promote it to encourage people to go there. And um, yeah. like the also also I, I, I find the experience actually like it's it's quite samey. So I tend to get kind of bored quite quickly and go and try and see if I can dive down and find a turtle or something doing something interesting. Um, and I mean, I obviously that's a really like uh, a privileged position that I have been really lucky to see whale sharks in other parts of the world and, and in the Philippines as well. Um, but yeah, it's not something I'd really recommend for people that are um, like actually keen to go and see and have a awesome experience with wildlife. I, d I don't think it is that. Yeah. The last time, do you know where Sumalon Island is right there? Is that just offshore? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah I've seen it. Yeah. I mean, literally a, th a, a stone's throw. I always stay there, and I end up, they take me to the whale sharks for the one hour or whatever, and then I come back and I dive for a week around the island. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. the, wall, the wall dive. <laughs> I can completely but honestly, understand that. The, yeah, I can almost see Cebu, and, you know, like, it's really not that far from where I live, Dumaguete. It's mm. just a 15-minute boat ride from here to Cebu, so a lot of people, a lot of people come from there or go back from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. I mean, how much it's developed as a tourism and um, destination. Um, but yeah, oh, yeah, I don't think I don't think the management has really kept up with uh, the influx of tourists. Yeah. Last time I was there, like a year, uh, I, we counted up how many people were there per day. I talked to whoever, and then how much they charge per day, and it was like thirty to fifty thousand dollars a day, mm. and it's insane. And that doesn't that doesn't include what the like the dive centers like. They also take people diving there. Yep. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a lot for any Filipino company. Any. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for sure. Yeah, I mean that's especially like when the costs aren't very high, <laughs> presumably. Oh, they're nothing. They're they're nothing. So even I mean, there's dive resorts that would kill to make that much per month here. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. So I wonder what they're doing now with no tourists. You can't go there during the COVID. I heard they're still feeding them to keep them around, but ah, uh, yeah, I was gonna say that'd be interesting to know actually because um. Yeah, like you also asked about the impacts on the sharks themselves, and it's it's actually quite tough to know um, because it's only been very recently that we've been able to start doing what we call kind of physiological research on whale sharks, like um, obtaining sort of blood samples and things, and um, so we can look more at their actual like markers of good health um, or stress or things like that. 
And so there's the the information is very limited. I mean, personally, I kind of think uh, in these situations where where there's a lot of profit being made that the owners sh should probably be on the industry to prove it isn't harmful to the sharks rather than for everyone else to prove that it is if there's going to be management changes. Like, I think that's kind of like a bit backwards. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, some of these sharks do seem to come and go. Um, you certainly see a lot of the sharks that are kind of regulars at the area. Um, they'll have a lot of lesions like around the top lip and the, the lips and stuff where they've been bumping into the boats repeatedly. Um, but those lesions probably only last for a, or that kind of scar tissue um, probably only lasts for a few weeks, like if they stop and move away. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting one. It's hard to, it's, as far as I'm aware, like the information to date, it, it's hard to, it, like there isn't really a much in the way of positive benefits for the sharks, but it's um, not necessarily clear detrimental benefit, sorry, um, like negative impacts on the sharks either. It's just the, the information's pretty tough to, pretty tough to get really. Certainly, I mean, it's changing the behavior for sure. I mean, some of them is staying there for weeks on end. Um, but how much harm that does them as individuals is, of course, um, um, tough to prove. It would be interesting to know about how, like, what sort of quality their actual diet is. Like, because, I mean, whale sharks, I think of them as being, like, ocean Labradors. Like, they're pretty food motivated. Like, if they know they can get food from a place, there's a good chance they're going to keep coming back for a while. Um, but whether it's actually like healthy food for them or whether it's like kind of screwing up their diet balance or something, because again, it's quite hard to know. There's a lot of shrimp farms here. Maybe they squish up some shrimp or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it is like, um, uh, like sort of shrimp and fish and things. So, I mean, they do eat, shrimp and fish um and that but like they eat a lot of other stuff as well so it's just okay is that a healthy balanced diet for a whale shark it's kind of don't exactly know right now i think there's a fine line of how to study that though because i know a lot of people are using like study and research as an excuse to uh start zoo uh you know big aquariums and stuff like that yeah um after i was in Oslo a few times they the tourism board of Kenya flew me there because they're thinking about starting a uh, something similar, but with huge like they have tons of whale sharks. Mm -hmm. So I think it's called like Eastern Africa Whale Shark Foundation, something like that. And they want to make a whole sea pin, like yeah. miles long, I guess, along the shore. And yeah. they took me out, and there's just a thousand whale sharks out there. I mean, I didn't see a thousand, but they show me pictures later and stuff. They're just so many. But they were using the justification that people are hunting them as well. Um, yeah. But Sorry, then I have some, I have some other thoughts groups. about that one. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I thought it was great while I was there. And then that's just one side of it. Then you go hear, you know, all the other solutions that are intrusive. So I, yeah. I'd like to hear your thoughts. No, have you heard of this there? Um, yeah, I've actually, there's, I inputted to their, I haven't heard anything for a few years, so I don't know how much the, the plans are still sort of ongoing for that. Um, the th thing, there's, um, based on the data I've seen, the whale shark numbers have gone down a lot off Kenya, um, but the thing is, it's not necessarily due to fishing, and we're not aware of any, like, sure, whale sharks very occasionally get caught in nets and stuff along the whole East African coast. Um, but there's no targeted fishery that I've ever seen evidence of, and certainly not in the, even bycatch is pretty rare over the last few years. Um, so I don't think, again, it's like that kind of conservation versus we, we have to do this, other, other, otherwise they'll be killed, doesn't really stack up for me. And I mean, I'm pretty, I, I'm not too familiar with Kenya itself, um, but I've done a lot of work in Tanzania um, now, and I'm, I'm pretty pretty familiar with Western Indian Ocean whale sharks. And um, yeah, I, I mean, there's, looking at the environmental impact assessments they they had, I mean, there was no real plan for what they were going to do with these whale sharks once they were in these pens. Um, also what the, 
um, like the, the, the communities they were saying were hunting the sharks were not the communities that were benefiting from the tourism either. So there really wasn't much of a conservation strategy in place. Um, and also the impact of like these giant sea pens on the environment hadn't been considered either. The, um, so it, it's a, when they were talking about kind of like having whale sharks for uh, like up to a few months and then releasing them, it's like, well, effectively, you're potentially giving people a license to keep whale sharks in suboptimal conditions and then kind of dumping them when they get sick. And because, I mean, that's easily how it can work out. And plenty of aquariums do that. Um, I've got nothing against good aquariums, but they're unfortunately um, not all aquariums are good. Um, and the, the thing is, if there's that many whale sharks to be seen, then wild whale shark tourism is possible too. And there's no real downside to the sharks from that. I, I mean, we, as long as people adhere to sort of pretty basic kind of like codes of practice, codes of conduct kind of thing, um, then wild whale shark tourism, we haven't really seen any detrimental impacts uh, from that when it's done well. So yeah, that, that's always my first preference. Um, but if it's gonna be sold as a conservation project, then the conservation benefits really have to stack up to me. And that one did not stack up at all. Yeah, it really didn't to me either. And I don't think they were full in the Kenyan government. Like when I was there, there was they were turned down so many times for like every permit you could think of. So I think they're gonna start resorting to just tours, maybe like, maybe like Oslo or something, I don't know. Yeah. Right now yeah. they're just a dive dive company, I guess. Yeah. But they they there was all sorts of other solutions like they were saying the whales were, or the sharks were killed for oil, some kind of oil for boats or something. But then they had all these new uh palm oil plantations built, which I don't know if that's good for the environment, but all of a sudden they didn't need the shark oil at all. So that's all yeah. that and then they started funding uh park rangers or whatever to actually enforce the laws about killing sharks so yeah there's a lot easier ways yeah do. yeah i think just like the preferred conservation strategy for me is always just to not kill them really yeah <laughs> it's the, and, yeah. So, and sometimes it's not easy to you know you still have to have funding for that of course um but like i like that kind of solutions orientated thinking like if, if people are are killing sharks for like their liver oil or anything like replacing with other oil um preferably synthetic i guess um or like if or like enforcing the laws that exist but um like in kenya i'm not aware that actually whale sharks are protected there yet um so i mean I my... think, i'm pretty sure they are because they were turned down hard they didn't want any uh i'm pretty sure they're protected because they were trying to fight with the government and say they're they are protecting them and all that so I think maybe not as much as ta Tanzania, I don't know, but I remember there being a lot of rules when I was there. And yeah. they were definitely, probably like Philippines used to be, just not very well enforced. Yeah, there's, well, there's, I mean, because Kenya's got, um, had quite a few successes, of course, with uh, terrestrial conservation, like with their national parks and things. And uh, I mean, that's where a lot of their tourism comes from. So it's good that they are, uh, um, definitely thinking about that, like, okay, what is sustainable tourism? Uh, like, what do it's kind of like, what do you want the country to be known for? So, um, it's good that they are yeah. at least thinking about that, like, like more broadly, not talking about that specific project necessarily. Yeah, I think, I think they wanted to be able to say you could see the biggest fish one day and then the biggest land animal the next. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the elephants. <laughs> Good marketing. Well, Good I don't marketing know how long. For sure. uh, yeah, not many, not many can say that. Yeah. I don't know how long. I don't want to keep you forever. There's just so many topics I could think of, like uh, good and bad aquariums and things. There's just so much out there. So. Uh, well, um, well I, I mean, I can answer a couple if you want. Like with that, with that one. So um, there's my kind of thing of like a good. There's some really, um, like we work with some several aquariums um, and they, the the ones that tend to prioritize research and conservation tend to be the nonprofit ones. Um, so I actually, like, the thing is conservation work is really hard to fund. Like, even though lots of people love going out to see animals and diving and things and that, there's not, 
it's it's very difficult to fund uh, research and conservation efforts. Like there isn't really a direct link between, say, the tourism and the like the the management and learning more about the animals. Um, and some aquariums have been really good for that. Like um, like we've done uh, quite a bit of work recently with uh, Georgia Aquarium in the states. Um, and yeah, they uh, have, of course, I was going to ask about that one. Yeah, and and also Okinawa Aquarium. Um, which is the ones, the research team that pioneered like the underwater ultrasound and things like that, which have been, uh, so it's, it's really nice to see some of these aquariums um, that are able to genuinely like come up with sort of new technologies and things and get them working in an aquarium environment and then be able to translate that to the field uh, where we can do more um, like kind of in situ conservation work and, um, and, and research work, of course, as well. So yeah, there's my, my kind of rule of thumb is like if the aquarium's a non profit, it's it's probably okay. And if the education is really good, um, if it's a for profit and there isn't much education, then I'd sort of steer clear. Yeah. So more spe specifically, um, the Georgia Aquarium, they they have people actually studying the whale shark. Yeah. Um, so they've got actually quite a decent team there. There's and they're doing some. Uh, some excellent work in the field as well. So we've been working with them in uh, Galapagos and St. Helena Island in the middle of the Atlantic, uh, which has been a really interesting one. And they're, they're leading that project. And um, uh, they're also supporting some work on like the global uh, genomics of whale shark. So the whale shark genome has been sequenced now by that team. And um, we're now applying that to field research to try and figure out like, at the moment, we, based on what's been done to date, we kind of know the Atlantic population of whale sharks is sort of separate from like the Indo-Pacific, um, and the Indo-Pacific seems to be quite homogenous. Uh, but like with the genomics, like we can look at questions like that in a lot higher resolution. So we can start seeing if whether okay, do do the Philippines whale sharks mix with the Galapagos whale sharks, for instance? Like at the moment, because it's so hard to find the adults, it's been really tough for us to answer questions like that. Uh, but by being able to look at their actual genome, then we can we can kind of see if they are actually interbreeding in places we don't see them or, or yeah, stuff like that. There's a lot we can do with that kind of thing. So, yeah. That's, that's really uh, a relief, I guess you'd call it. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I hate the sharks in the tank, but kind of like zoos, you know. But I, I, that's how I felt. I thought they're all like uh, Shamu, you know, uh, yeah. Shamu type thing. But then I went to a Dubai Aquarium. Have you have you been there? No. Um, they gave they gave me like a behind the scenes tour, because you know they have all the it's the biggest one after Georgia, and they have all the rare sharks and. Uh, rays and guitar sharks like cool stuff and uh um but they took me to the science like behind the scenes where nobody gets to see and it's all tanks and breeding and research and scientists and stuff i was like whoa so this is how you fund like yeah. the research that would never get done otherwise i yeah. mean they were trying to breed uh rare seahorses like they had all these tanks trying to like rehabilitate uh endangered seahorses and like all this stuff i was like wow so there's a whole different uh that's the only way they're going to be able to fund all this research and that yeah. stuff the, the the tourists nobody even gets to see yeah they just get to see the the shiny ones to pay for the science yeah there's a really good example also from dubai that i've i've done quite a lot of work with um so my friends were running um a sea turtle rescue and rehab center in dubai and they've they've had thousands of turtles go through that center um and they're doing things like 3d printing them new sections of shells and like all, all kinds of awesome awesome stuff and um that was funded by the the um the kind of hotel uh, where it was based because they they were also maintaining like a small aquarium in the lobby. And it was just like, and that allowed all this other amazing work being done on endangered species. So I, I definitely like, as I said, there's like, there's, there's uh, not all aquariums are equal, um, but certainly I think some, some aquariums and zoos can 
there's certainly the potential there to do some pretty amazing work. Um, and, and when they are making sure that their like aquariums are also, when they're really doing a lot of good education work to make sure that people that do visit kind of leave as ambassadors for like marine conservation wildlife, uh, but also when they're putting like putting back into the wild populations to make sure that the whole species is benefiting. Um, yeah, then, yeah, I, I think that can be a, a pretty powerful thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's actually, I didn't even think of this. The When I was talking to Dan about the rare frogfish, they were, I mean, trying to study. Not all the scientists were able to go to uh, the middle of Indonesia and all these places to study where they are at. So I guess there's some benefits of... Uh, Finding uh, up one place where they can go, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's it's a pretty cool. Get this work done a lot of the time, so um, it's really nice when, um, as as long as again, like you know, you you mentioned the the case before, like if Oslob was entirely funding our research and that, well, like I, at the moment, I wouldn't be comfortable taking that money because I don't really, I can't wholeheartedly support what they're doing there. Um, but like for places that I'm more comfortable working with, then yeah, that's, I mean, that's one of the only ways we can, I mean, you know, like with our work, we got uh, whale sharks listed as a globally endangered species. We've got them listed now on appendix one of the convention of migratory species, which is the nearest we can kind of get to global protection. Um, also, and like lots of national protection, lots of sustainable tourism and things. And it's like, unfortunately, it's really hard to fund that stuff. Um, so uh, it's it's really nice that there are organisations out there that are able to put money into it to be able to keep like keep keep the keep the field work going as well. Wow, that's an awesome awesome system. <laughs> yeah. So well, I have a thousand other questions, but I'll just leave you with uh, one more. Sure. Um, if you had unlimited funds, un a billion dollars for whale sharks for any project you want to do what would you be doing um it would actually be at the moment the the biggest question i have for them from a conservation perspective is what is going on in china um, because there was a big fishery for them and we haven't had much information out of there for a few years so i would use that money to try and like have a lot of training for the fisheries managers and observers and that to make sure that uh that the because they are protected in china um but it wasn't really being enforced so to get that fishery stopped in china basically because they think that is the biggest single threat to them yeah I was and i'll see how much that. was left afterwards <laughs> well so they're not they are the biggest threat to whale sharks well it depends what's actually going on there now um so i mean they certainly were um, and it's there's just it's been a bit of a, a black hole in terms of information. So I don't know if that's because the I mean, there's definitely still sharks getting caught there because they turn up in the media occasionally. Um, but it might not be the big numbers that it used to be. But the estimates were uh, about a thousand whale sharks being caught a year. And this is in the two like um, that paper was published in 2012. So that's not very long ago. Um, so unless things have really significantly changed there, that that is yes the biggest single threat to whale sharks like existence really ah uh, so you need a bunch of undercover guys <laughs> yeah some, something yeah something. probably taiwan taiwan as well maybe oh taiwan's protect the sharks actually um oh, really? 2007 uh well, yeah, I think the the fishery stopped in 2007. So that's actually where Georgia Aquarium got their whale sharks from. So they were sharks that were caught in the fishery there, and they bought them from the fishers and got them used to being fed and stuff in, in sort of sea pens and then flew them over to Georgia. So, um, yeah, those sharks didn't have a happy future. Um, so it's, yeah, that's where they came from. Oh, uh, okay. All right, man. Well... I better stop there before I think of something else. <laughs> no, it's been a pleasure, mate. Thank Maybe we can yeah, do a part uh, two sometime. Uh, definitely, definitely. Do you got, when, when do you go out next? Any word on when, uh, <laughs> uh, when I, you're free to go? Yeah, it depends what's happening with the global situation, I think. We've got a, 
I, I'm kind of helping on a couple of projects on um, other shark species in Australia. Um, so I think I'll probably be there before I go anywhere else, but we'll see. Yeah, at the moment, I'm just trying to catch up with all the office work that's been accumulating while I've been out having fun. <laughs> well, if you need any uh, spies to go to China for you, just let me know. <laughs> Cheers, mate. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's like, oh, I only take half a billion. Yeah, I won't take it all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, anything else you want to talk about or say or anything? Uh, I'm good for now. If there's any follow-up, right. hopefully we can catch up in a bit and I can tell you what else we've found. We What we thought we knew what, that was wrong now. <laughs> yeah, you go figure something else out and I'll call you in a year and tell, <laughs> tell us. <laughs> Sweet, mate. Great All right. Thanks, man. Bye. Cheers. Yeah. Subscribe.